Welcome back to The Couple. Today I'm joined by Thea Thurmanen. Thea is the executive director of Replanet, a new European network of environmental organizations. Thea is also a biologist and a member of the Green Party of Finland. Thea, welcome to Decouple. Thank you so much. Good to be here. And um, you're going to have to excuse uh, my poor pronunciation of your name and of uh, a number of Finnish words uh, throughout this episode. Um, I've got a poor track record. Uh, every time I talk to Ida Rishalm, I, I mess it up in some way, shape or form. I'm actually usually pretty good with languages and accents, but but for whatever reason, Finnish just befuddles me. So do you want yeah, to say your name different. properly? They are Törmanen. I mean, you did really good, uh, actually. All right. Okay. <laughs> See if I can keep it up. So they, we we met in uh, in Glasgow at COP26 um, in this uh, you know household full of pro nuclear advocates. Um, you were there for week one. Um, I was there for week two. We kind of passed the baton over, but we did get a chance to chat a little bit. Um, and I've been um, really meaning to chat with uh, um, someone from Finland, and particularly someone who works within the Finnish Green Party, because um, it strikes me as quite an anomaly. Um, that there is a Green Party somewhere in the world that um, has embraced nuclear energy. Um, I'm not sure what where it sort of currently stands um, in terms of the the degree of support, but certainly no longer opposes it. Um, and I think has um, opening attitudes towards genetic engineering as well. Um, and also just to explore uh, Finland, where you know you guys are building new nuclear plants. You're connecting, and I think the Europe's first EPR to the grid, and you're probably further along than anywhere else in the world on the construction of the of of you know first deep geologic repository for spent nuclear fuel so there, i've had a lot of sort of curiosities about finland and uh really excited to kind of follow up on some of those preliminary conversations we had in glasgow so again um a warm welcome thank you yeah so i wanted to you know as as is the case on the couple wanted to give you a chance to introduce yourself a little bit further i i gave a little bare bones introduction there so yeah take a minute or two and tell the audience more about yourself Yes, thank you. So I've been politically active since I was uh, 15, 16. My mother was very active in like the local politics. And I've also been interested in, in nature and animals as long as I can remember. So I became like an environmentalist already before I even started school. I was writing um, to my notebooks that I hate people that uh, are destroying the rainforest and stuff like that. So, so that's... Mm-hmm. That's been uh, who I am um, for for a long time. I wasn't in a Green Party um, in the beginning because they were anti-nuclear. So I've always been pro-nuclear. Um, so I never, I was never anti, even though I can remember the Chernobyl thing. And I, we were, we've been living in Eastern Finland um, the whole time. Uh, but my parents didn't freak about it or anything. So to me, it was, wasn't like this big uh, thing. So I've always supported nuclear. Uh, as an environmental fr- ener- friendly energy, um, I I have a degree in physiotherapy, physical physical therapy, and also in animal behavior. And I used to play American football in the states for DC Divas. And after I quit my uh, football career, I was also playing for the national team of Finland. So I have two bronze medals from the world championships. I started to focus more on on the environmentalism. And especially after I graduated, um, I did my dissertation in my master's uh, degree about killer whales. Um, it's actually the population um, in San Juan Island. So it's right in the border of the U.S. and Canada. So I was there yep. studying the killer whales. And I have two daughters who are seven and three. This is what I love about self-introductions. Um, yeah. <laughs> You're fascinating. You're a fascinating person. There's just so much there that I would have missed. So, uh, thanks. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, okay, so in terms of kind of where to dive in, I mean, let's just start with with Finland as a place. I, you know, what you're saying was really striking me that um, you know, despite being pretty close to Chernobyl, um, that you'd sort of always grown up understanding nuclear as being good for the environment. A um, few things that I know about Finland. Um, a pretty highly educated public. I understand all teachers, I think right down to the elementary level, need to have a master's degree um, like yes. in, in pedagogy. Um, part of the sort of Scandinavian social democracy experiment, um, I'm imagining 
kind of trust in institutions and sciences as part of it. But help help me fill me in a bit more on on the context of Finland um, and why perhaps um, you know you grew up in 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 the beliefs that you had, and also maybe that's going to help frame for us um, why the Finnish Green Party is is taking a more open minded position towards some. Of yeah, so we have a like a high thing. level of, of social cohesion cohesion in Finland, and. Uh, we trust uh, the politicians and the institutions and yes we do have a very high level of education and Finns have always been known to adapt new technologies uh, very easily i mean uh, text mes- messaging was invented by a finnish person and we had nokia and so so um, everyone mm-hmm. had a cell phone really quickly in finland and like internet banking i remember living in the the us and the uk and i i thought uh, Everything was so ancient because in Finland we'd had like internet banking since us since us was fifteen or something like that, and then in the UK they were like, "Oh, we have this new thing right now," and we're like, "Oh, <laughs> this is all news in Finland." <laughs> so, so Finnish people in in, in general have been very um, pro technology, I think, and that's probably mm. one of the reasons. Um, the support for nuclear has always been pretty high in Finland. Now it's in record levels. Uh, but it was already high before. Um, there were some ups and downs, uh, but it stayed uh, right now in the record levels for like four years in a row or so. So it's very stable to support for nuclear in Finland. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. I mean, wh- why do you think that is? Um, you know, I've been talking to advocates from all over the world and getting a context of of the sort of rise and fall of uh, of attitudes towards nuclear energy, um, and certainly, you know, the accidents um, had mm-hmm. a big impact. Um, yeah, also in Finland. Know, fears about fears about nuclear weapons, et cetera. So why 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 do you think there's been a sort of pervasive positive attitude towards nuclear in Finland? Um, well, we started the Eco Modernist Society of Finland in 2015, and uh, um, right after that, I mean, just a year year after that, I think the IPCC report came out, which was like the first uh, very serious report saying that okay, we are in so much trouble right now. And at the same time, um, there was a discussion that started within the Green Party in 2016. Um, then some prominent members of the Green Party uh, came out saying that they have changed their mind. And then there was a kind of permission for others to change their mind as well. Mm-hmm. And so it kind of started snowballing from there. And we had this uh, seminar about SMRs. Uh, um, by the eco-modernists, uh, and we invited uh, speakers from all over the world. So we had this international seminar uh, before these SMRs weren't in the public discussion at all in Finland. And we made the evening news, like the main news in Finland, and there were several articles. So that sparked the whole public discussions about uh, SMRs in Finland. And we realized that we could be using nuclear for heating, which is a big issue in Finland, obviously mm. for, <laughs> for obvious reasons. Um, so. Uh, there were many, many things that uh, happened at the same time. Um, so in the Greens, I in this subsection of Greens uh, called the Greens for Science and Technology. And these were the Greens within the Green Party who started the whole uh, nuclear discussion, started actively promoting it uh, within the Green Party. Um, there were other people as well, but... Um, Osmo Soinivara, who was one of the founders of the Greens for Science and Technology, was one of the first ones to kind of go back on his stance about nuclear. I think the first article he wrote about this was in, already in 2008, uh, saying that he could consider nuclear if it was replacing fossil fuels and not just um, covering the, the increased energy consumption. Um, but but the, the turn in uh, the... Finnish Green Party happened really quickly. It was um, about in four years that we went from uh, complete opposition to a neutral stance where it is now. So there's no anti-nuclear stuff in the, the principles of the party. It's very technology neutral. Okay, so it's technology technology neutral, but not sort of enthusiastically supportive, or is that just is it kind of ridiculous for politically political party to be enthusiastically supportive? No, I mean we have some technology. members like re, like our vice chair, one of the vice chairs of the party at the moment, Atte Harjani, who got the most votes mm-hmm. in the vice chair elections within the Green Party. Actually, he's like the loudest voice for nuclear within the Green Party. Mm. 
So it's it's so, definitely the, okay to be very actively uh, promoting nuclear within mm-hmm. the party right now. I definitely want to like, come back uh, and explore a little bit more um, some of the characteristics of Finland. And you're, you're mentioning the the heating and district heating is mm-hmm. is a thing I think within within Finland to a certain degree, and also Finland's you know um, facing disproportionate climate impacts in terms of the degree of heating. I think um, being a, a Nordic country, I just looking at those heat maps that that come out on the news every once in a while where you know, Finland's experiencing temperatures that are like 10 or 15 degrees higher than, than what's typical or, or what's you yeah. know, their average. Um, but before we get there, um, just this kind of um, paradox that I see within um, the green movement. Um, you know, I've, I've been doing a bit of research and trying to see what are sort of the core um, foundational principles of, of the Green Party. And there's, there's you know, I think um, a lot there in terms of social and environmental justice commitments, nonviolence, but a big one is is direct democracy. Um, and so I, the paradox that I see is that um, certainly in my own country, where I've dabbled a little bit in green politics, mostly via you know Facebook groups and things like that, is that there's um, a possibility for grassroots discussion to occur and for policy to move up the frame, like it's things move upwards rather than being dictated downwards. Um, but at the same time, um, anti nuclearism really seems to be baked into the DNA um, of, of the green movement globally. Um, and that's what's so interesting about Finland bucking this trench. But again, that paradox between a sort of direct democracy and, and um, bottom-up policymaking and um, you know, the, the core principles of, of the green movement are, are of interest to me. Um, because at a certain point, if everything is open to you know, debate and, and that kind of direct participation, then you know, can can the principles stand? That can anything be challenged? Um, I'm not sure if I'm I'm kind of making sense there, but um, no, you are. I guess, yeah. Okay, maybe, maybe you can take it from there. I'm <laughs> yeah, yeah, because I, I think one of the reasons why it changed in Finland because the Green Party is very democratic party. So within the Green mm-hmm. Party, there you have a chance uh, to actually change everything. So you can right. take down these old principles that you think would be set in stone. Um, I've been in other parties before, uh, and I think in like within the Greens, uh, there's a really healthy discussion culture, and it's actually put into kind of the principles of the party that we tolerate different views, and different mm-hmm. views mm-hmm. must be articulated and, and argumented for. Um, and so this is the culture we wanted to have within the party, and that has resulted in... in and it's not just about nuclear. Um, for example, well, the current uh, geopolitical uh, situation in Europe, uh, many Greens mm-hmm. used to oppose NATO quite a bit, uh, like saying we absolutely shouldn't join NATO. Now, within like a week, most of the, the, the prominent Green politicians have changed their mind, saying that, oh, I've changed my mind. I support joining NATO right, right now. So we have this mm-hmm. ability within the Finnish Greens uh, to change our opinion and that's okay. So I think uh, that's one of the reasons why we were able to do it in Finland. So um, tolerating different views came, came first. And after that, we have been able to uh, change our position on, on, on several things, not just nuclear. So are the Finnish Greens, um, do they fit within the, because uh, there's a European, an EU European parliament. Um, do they do they send members there to that EU parliament? And if so, um you know, what, what is the sort of um, response of the EU Greens um, to some of these uh, new policy positions um, that the Finnish Greens are taking? Is that, does that cause tensions? Um, are you guys <laughs> we, we do get feed- or outcast? Or- <laughs> uh, we do get feedback. Um, <laughs> so we've been definitely noticed. And, and yeah, there have been some uh, uh, messages saying that. Uh, I, I mean, I'm sure that not all the European Greens like us. Because um, there's even rumors that I, I encounter uh, in many countries when I'm doing my my environmental work. Um, people say that um, no, the the Finnish Greens don't really say this, and this is just you know a plot, and these are fake Greens. And I've heard rumors like this, um, so I, mm. I I think we're troubling um, to many kind of old people that think in the old way within the Greens because. We've been able to change our minds, and it's for some some people it means that we're not really green. Uh, when in fact, uh, the reasons uh, why the Finnish Greens changed their mind were about climate crisis and, and 
environmental reasons. And but yeah, uh, we do have uh, like do- members of the parliament uh, from Finland who mm-hmm. are in the green group within the parliament. So we have three people there. And, and do these changes of attitudes um, extend further than nuclear? I mean, you're, you're mentioning Finland tends to be a pretty um, early adopter of technologies, to be pretty techno-optimist. Um, and that sort of flies in the face of a lot of green aesthetics and culture, shall we say, um, mm-hmm. in terms of, you know, I, I within Canada, there's lots of concerns about genetic engineering, but also, you know, more um, quirky topics like 5G, etc. cetera. Um, how, how do the how do the, the the Finnish Greens position themselves on these other other topics like genetic engineering or well know, the other, subsection other yeah yeah so the Greens for Science and Technology are very pro GMO uh, I don't think that's uh, like uh, the position of the whole party at the moment um, I don't actually remember like what what what's the current status of it but I think like um, the average green is more suspicious of GMOs than the, the greens for science and technology. So there, I think we have still a lot of work to do. Um, there's also a lot of discussion about organic farming and whether that's good or bad uh, within the mm. party. So I think that agriculture uh, discussion is still um, going on and it's not as uh, developed as the, the energy discussion within the party. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. How like how how big is Finland again? What's what's the population? I'm just trying to get a sense. I mean, within within smaller countries, we have a regions, little over have these... yeah five million people. Okay, so small, so not a... <laughs> very small. <laughs> yeah, I was I was talking to to I'm gonna butcher another Finnish name, Rauli Partanen, um, and he was just mentioning you know the um, disappointment of seeing Germany shut down. Um, it's, uh, you know, three of its remaining six reactors. Um, and I think that equaled kind of all of the emissions of, of Finland in a sense, you know, just this sense of like, we're, we're doing our part. We're getting yeah. the first EPR going, we're making some progress and, and it's being erased by what, what the Germans are doing. Um, just being, you know, much larger country. Yeah. Can you, can you, can you give me a, I, I think, um, I'd like to get a broader sense of, um, again, this tension between, um, some of the policies that the Finnish Greens are taking on, um, and the sort of core values of the global green movement. Can can you like as you understand it, what makes a green a green? Um, well, I, how I feel about it is that like being green for me is being a protector of the environment. Uh, it's about um, I mean, it's about being uh, pro-human as well and protecting the environment and to me it's also uh, very much about science and and how science and technology can help us to do these things so i don't i don't really feel a connection um to greens that want to go back in time um so there there's this section that thinks that if we you know we go back to nature and we live more um naturally uh, which to me as a biologist is a really weird concept uh, <laughs> anyway, because, I mean, this is how we live now as a species and it's just as natural as something that we did before. Um, so I don't, so there's this uh, green, part of the green movement who's like reminiscing the old times and thinking that we are falling from nature, whereas I think uh, we're risen from nature and we have the opportunity to do some really great things um so going back in time to me it's not an option and uh, i think there is a disconnect between these pro technology greens and these um you know let's just live more like more of a simple life uh, type of greens and that's that's a very difficult uh, discussion to have because uh, we have this uh, when we had the the city council elections for example, um, I was talking to some uh, other green candidates who were really like pro living in in yard, yurts or something like that, and so that we must, you know, um, not use electricity at all and and stuff like that. And to me, that's very uh, foreign type of thinking. And I we did try to discuss these things, but we're approaching the subjects from so like in from very different angles. It's really hard to kind of put them together and and 
Yeah. I mean, there's there's such diff- there's such different angles that they don't seem that they really fit under the same tent, or if you'll forgive me, under the same yurt roof. Um, <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? Like, uh, it, and I guess like the ideas that you're sharing, um, they seem to fit um, under the umbrella of eco modernism. Like, do you consider yourself to be an eco modernist? Uh, I do. Um, uh, right now, uh, when I'm working with Replanet, we kind of um, uh, changed that to being eco-humanist uh, because mm-hmm. uh, we have organizations um, who don't you know, identify as eco-modernist. So me, to me, the, the name of the philosophy doesn't really matter. Um, the content does. Uh, and mm-hmm. it's, it's about being pro-science, pro-technology, pro-human and optimistic about the future and how we can solve these problems. And it's, it's about going forward, not backwards. Um, so those are the, the main things I care about. Right, right. Yeah, no, I just, uh, I find myself in a situation where I feel like a, a huge amount of my my energy that I'd much rather put into, you know, solving our big problems um, goes into fighting what I'll call sort of a rear guard action against mm-hmm. traditional environmentalists and, and really their political political representation is is generally the the kind of the green party um so i'm just yeah i'm I'm wondering about that that tension and whether you feel that as well um you know being associated under the same umbrella um with folks like you know the uh, the 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 belgian minister of energy who's you know championing the shutdown of the remaining nuclear fleet there or yeah i don't i don't really consider them green um to me anyone who's who wants to build new gas plants when we have climate crisis going on cannot be green. It's just, mm-hmm. it's such a big contradiction for me. You can't, you can't, uh, I, I think she stated in some interview that, you know, it needs to get a little dirty before it gets clean or something like that. That's just ridiculous. I mean, we can't be investing in new fossil fuels. We cannot be, um, shutting down low carbon energy production at this moment. Uh, in Finland, uh, Fortum just applied for um, uh, 20 years of contu- continuation um, to run the Lovisa plants. So that's great news because um, extending the lifetime of existing nuclear plants is one of the co- cost effective methods you can do um, for emission reductions. And then we have countries shutting down perfectly working nuclear plants. I, I don't know um how they can think it's green um to me that I, I i just don't get it um i don't think they deserve to call themselves green really that's my opinion and and, and it does make me angry to be under the same umbrella and i think other greens uh should kind of stand up more and say that this is absolutely not a green thing to do mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, let's let's jump back again to uh, explore a bit more of the the particularities of of Finland. So, um, I was mentioning a little bit earlier that I have the sense that that Finland is warming faster than sort of the global average. Um, what are what are the sort of impacts of of climate change? How visible are they to to the average Finn? Uh, very. Um, I'm, for example, like a big fan of uh, winter sports. And you can definitely see, especially like Novembers and Decembers in Finland have become much warmer than they used to be. Uh, right now, uh, I cannot see uh, outside because we have so much snow. And so <laughs> because the temperatures are going, um, well, it's getting warmer. So that that actually means more snowfall in certain areas of Finland, like Eastern Finland and Lapland, because we still stay below zero so all the the rain comes as snow uh and then it's more rainy now uh during the winter so there's so so much snow that we don't know where to put it um so some people think oh but it, we have you know better winters now uh because we have more snow but it's actually a lot warmer than it used to be and that's why we have more snow because when it's like minus 20 minus 30 that we still have sometimes here during winter it's not snowing then so it's these warmer weathers that makes it makes it snow a lot more but you can definitely see it that the winters are getting shorter um there was in even uh winter like uh two years ago here in eastern finland which is like the snow one of the snowiest places in in finland 
that we lost almost all the snow uh, in like December, January. Um, uh, and my grandfather, uh, he's uh, turning 92 this year, and he couldn't remember uh, a winter like that in Eastern Finland that we absolutely mm-hmm. didn't have any snow at some point. So you can definitely see see it here close to the Arctic Circle. And our capital city, Helsinki, is having really miserable winters right now mm-hmm. because, yeah, it's raining. And, and it, um, <clears throat> in, in Helsinki, it's usually like above zero, so it's rain. It's not snow anymore. Mm-hmm. Right. And in terms of the energy mix right now, what does that what does that look like in Finland? And and you you mentioned um you know this this question of of I mean your your Nordic country things are getting warmer but you still need to stay warm, um you know what are, what are the options available um that are you know low carbon or that are classified as renewable you know what's what's currently being done give, give us give us a sense of that yeah uh, so electricity is pretty clean here in Finland because we have some hydro not not as much as in uh, Norway for example but we do have some hydro uh, we have lots of nuclear um, we have wind. Uh, Wind power is increasing a lot in Finland. We have really good wind conditions. Uh, Solar, for obvious reasons, because we don't really have sun for like (laughs) three months in a year. Uh, It's not, uh, it's very minuscule in Finland. Um, And then uh, heating uh, is another thing, uh, which is much more difficult than electricity. So right now we're um, still using some fossil fuels. We're using peat, we're using biomass, and there's like a huge discussion going on about how much biomass we can actually use. Um, because uh, at some point, if you use a lot of biomass, then it's a threat to biodiversity. And a lot of our forest species are already threatened as it is uh, because of the, the forestry in Finland. I mean, we use we build things from wood and so on, so it's not just for, for heating. I mean, it's mostly residue. But still, if, the, uh, if we quit using coal, and natural gas for heating, then the pressure for inc- increasing biomass is, of course, a lot higher. And we don't really have any um, good solutions. Uh, we have some uh, like geothermal uh, projects, but they have been delayed quite a bit. Uh, there's some potential in that, but we definitely would need um, nuclear heat as well to, to clean the whole, whole uh, heating sector without increasing the use of biomass so much that it's not sustainable anymore. And is there a lot of uh, district heating infrastructure already set up? Like there'd be yeah, a I mean, to Yeah, heat? basically, yeah, yeah, all the cities in Finland are uh, in district heating. Um, and so it would be, that's why SMRs would be so good in Finland that you just replace the existing power plants with SMRs and then you basically clean the whole country country's uh, heating system because we do have this district district heating system so that's that's a benefit um then of course in the countryside we have houses that like my house isn't um in the district heating system but that's such a small amount uh, of houses compared um to the amount that we have in cities so mm-hmm. it's not a huge problem and then you uh, in the countryside you can use heat pumps and and stuff like that so yeah, that's that's a real challenge um, in Canada. We we just don't have the district heating infrastructure. So the idea of, of mm. decarbonizing it is kind of happens on a one house at a time measure yeah. rather than in a more coordinated yeah. way. Because unless you're unless you're talking about big apartment blocks. <clears throat> and in terms of um, you know one one of the big um, rationales for the opposition of nuclear energy is is the lack of you know the this question of of nuclear waste or spent nuclear fuel. Um, so like Finland's um, ahead of the pack in terms of working on that problem at Onkalo. Um, what, what can you tell us uh, about that? Um, I mean, how it's going and also whether or not that's a significant part of um, the reason why people are more open to nuclear energy in Finland. Well, it's very close um, to finishing the, the Onkalo and it has uh, proceeded in schedule. Um, so it's going well. Um, and the whole discussion uh, when Onkala was planned, it was very, even the Greens at the time when they were opposing nuclear, they were still pro Onkala because they thought it's re- a responsible thing to do because we're going to produce waste. So we are the ones who have to come up with a solution. So in Finland, unlike in Sweden, for example, the Greens um, supported the idea 
of the repository. And there were like several locations competing for the site. So we had, we didn't have this NIMBY problem at all uh, when it came to a repository. Mm. So it was a very easy process in Finland uh, for some reason. And what do you, I mean, how do you explain that um, in Canada right now? Um, you know, there were, I think, 30 or 40 communities um, that were identified as potential good sites, I think mostly based on the geology for a DGR, and we're down to two. And I mean, it's, it, there's a lot of, um, a lot of not in my backyard uh, sentiment. Um, it's been, you know, very weaponized by the anti-nuclear movement. Um, you know, there's politicians in the U.S., for God's sakes, that are, um, you know, passing resolutions against us building a repository, you know, hundreds and hundreds of kilometers um, on our side of the border. Um, so yeah, t tell me a little bit more about that. I think um, there's probably some reasons around that that we we sort of dabbled in at the beginning, describing Finland and its and its context. But yeah, t tell me a bit more about that if you have more information on that process. Um, well, it was a pretty long time ago. I wasn't that involved uh, in the topic at the time. But what I've heard it was that that they succeeded in talking to the locals and engaging them in the process. Um, and I think that that was uh, one of the most important things. But I don't, I don't really know why there was so little opposition. I think there must have been some like uh, traditional NGOs uh, being against it. I, I remember that. Uh, so there was some pushback from, from NGOs. Um, but not not from the political parties, um, as far as I I can uh, tell. And I think it's just, just the seems... <clears throat> Finnish people trust in engineers quite a bit, mm. and and so there was just you know, um, I this idea that well they have done these calculations and and it's it's perfectly safe, it's not going to cause us any trouble. And the locations, um, they would benefit it from financially because, you know, it's being built there and you get jobs and so on. So I think that that was the reason why it didn't cause any problems in Finland. Yeah, that's, that social trust seems huge. Um, it's something yeah. that's really decayed in a lot of societies. Um, and there's, you know, a lot of, um, yeah, just uh, not much respect anymore for expertise. Um, so that that's an interesting factor. But how would you explain then? Because you know we've been talking a little bit about Finland within the sort of Scandinavian model. I mean, Sweden's your next door neighbor, um, and you're describing some really different attitudes there. Mm -hmm. um, I know there's. I've heard there's some tension between the two countries. Um, <laughs> but can you give me especially a sense in of, ice uh, hockey? <laughs> <laughs> Can you give me a sense of um, you know your understanding of why there's that difference, despite sort of sharing a lot of commonalities. Yeah, there, there's. A, I've been giving interviews for a Swedish media because they're really interested why it's so different than Finland. Uh, for mm -hmm. example, right now, um, what's going on in Ukraine uh, in in Sweden? There were, I think, some even officials saying that you you should take some like tablets, you know. And in Finland, uh, all the officials were like, you absolutely shouldn't take anything right now. There's no danger and so on. And uh, one of my um, friends from Sweden said that the Finns are always the, the adult in this discussion, being rational and calm. Um, I don't really know um, the history behind the anti-nuclear uh, movement in Sweden and why that is. Uh, I would love to know. Um, why it's so different. I, I know that in Sweden, there's um, this culture of discuss, discussing everything a lot, like sharing opinions, and, and they don't think it's good to be like really certain of some things. Um, and, and as Finns have been accused of not having a discussion about the nuclear waste, and, and I've heard comments from Germany as well, saying that, oh, fin Finns have this solution because they didn't discuss it. So they think that because we all agreed, it means that we didn't have a proper discussion because, right, uh, right. yeah, <laughs> you're supposed to have some anti-arguments, even though there there aren't any good arguments against it. But you should have them uh, just, you know, because it's a principle to, to have a, like anti process. and pro. Yeah. And so, yeah. So I think we we don't have that principle. So if there aren't good arguments against something, then why fight about it? Um Maybe that's it. I don't know. Mm -hmm. 
All right. Well, <clears throat> maybe we'll wrap up soon, but um, why don't you give uh, give our listeners a sense of what's going on with Replanet? Um, you mentioned that you're, I think, the executive uh, director of that organization. Um, yeah. What's 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 going on with it? Why are you excited about it? I'm excited because this is like the first um, global movement that has these values of pro science, pro technology, pro human. Um, we just had our web page uh, launch like a few weeks ago. Uh, we already have groups uh, like organizations or active groups in 14 different uh, European countries. Uh, we have some action going on or starting in Australia as well. So hopefully we'll go global. Um, Right now, the focus is on the European pol politics, and we're very focused on the taxonomy discussion. Uh, we'll have a research unit because we want to base everything on science. So we have a research unit um, where we can produce uh, like uh, studies and, and publications and research papers and stuff like that. Um, and we're assembling an advisory board as well. Um, so great things happening. And I think uh, this is something that the, the world is waiting for. Uh, the time is now for a new type of thinking um, in environmental issues, because we know that the old ways are kind of lacking. So we want to uh, be in a network that gives solutions, not just a um, network saying you can't do this and saying no to everything. I think we need an environmental movement that says, OK, we can't do this, but then uh, We'll give some actual uh, proposals and solutions that that we can use, and we'll still have a uh, energy system that works. It will be clean. We'll have uh, proteins uh, available that are of, of low price to everyone, but it doesn't take all of, all of the land, um, and there will be room for biodiversity as well. Mm -hmm. So yeah, exciting. Yeah, I mean, I've I've been thinking a lot about, <clears throat> excuse me, thinking a lot about this recently, um, you know, and conceiving out of it as, as a little bit of a battle of ideas, right? There's competing visions. I think, you know, in a very wishy-washy sense, we as human beings generally have similar core goals of, you know, flourishing and prosperity and biodiversity mm -hmm. and, and all these things you're mentioning, but there's big, big disagreements about how to get there <clears throat> and big aesthetic disagreements in terms of, you know, whether that's a sort of eco-romantic, you know, back in time, decentralized uh, approach, or whether it's um, more uh, forward facing, as you're mentioning, pro-science, um, et cetera. And just looking at the sort of forces arrayed on on this, I, I don't want to get too kind of militaristic with this, but just sticking with this battle of ideas framework, the forces arrayed on that that field of, of ideologic battle are are interesting, right? I mean, um, there's very well established um, environmental organizations like Greenpeace, uh, you know, a number of ones in the States, uh, Sierra Club, Natural Resource Defense Council, um, you know, with global annual operating budgets in the billions of dollars. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so it's, it, to me, it sort of seems like a bit of a David and Goliath struggle, um, you know, mm -hmm. on, on Team David on, on this side, uh, you know, it's, it's a pretty ragtag group of, of folks that I think are quite regularly labeled as, as shills. And there's a lot of imagination that you know, um, organizations like yours might be receiving, you know, enormous funds from, uh, from industry and things like that. Um, We're not, but in by reality, the way. it's, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, uh, but anyway, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's quite the, quite the David and Goliath setup, but I guess everything starts, uh, from a, from a small seed and, um, we'll be interested to see where it, where it goes and whether this translates into uh, a political formation or a political party or, or what, what direction it takes. I'm not sure if you have a sense of, of long-term goals at, at this point, cause it sounds like it's pretty early days, but, uh, no, I, I do actually have like a very good idea of the long-term goals. Uh, we don't want to be affiliated with any political party. I think that's why we succeeded in Finland because we have members from all different political parties and mm. we cannot solve any environmental problems uh, just, you know, within the Greens. Um, we need all the parties involved and that's why we don't want to be affiliated with any, any political parties. Um, and I don't think we have to kind of win the traditional environmental movements because they're doing a lot of good stuff as well and they have the same goals. Uh, we just have to convince them to be more ambitious and um, give uh, 
like different options for how to do that, uh, a different vision. And in Finland, for example, we just had a demonstration a few weeks ago um, against uh, burning of biomass and peat for heating in the city of Tampere. And we were there with uh, XR, Greenpeace, and, and Fridays for Future activists. So we gave a speech. Uh, we mentioned nuclear. They were totally fine with it. Uh, we were marching along with all these other uh, NGOs. And so we were on the same side in that demonstration. Yeah, and we it's want to make that happen in every country in Europe. Mm -hmm. So we are on the same side. And as environmentalists, we have to realize that battling against each other uh, is when the fossil fuel, fuel industry wins. And we cannot afford mm -hmm. that. So we have to unite and get past our differences and work together to reach these goals. It's super interesting because, you know, the, the angle from Extinction Rebellion is often, well, we don't have a particular platform. We've identified a problem. We're going to protest against it. Um, but we, we don't have the solutions. We're just going to follow mm -hmm. the, like, quote unquote, follow the science. And so it, it strikes me that you guys are stepping in um, very much from the perspective of, of offering solutions. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Interesting. Okay, so um, we'll share in the show notes um, where people can find the Replanet website. Um, if people want to follow you and your work, um, what's the best way for them to uh, to follow that and to get in touch with you? Uh, well, I'm very active in Twitter, so you can follow me in Twitter. Um, and definitely uh, from our webpage, you can contact us and um, we'll get back to you. We have a Discord channel, for example, with very lively discussions about different environmental topics and um, you can also see like uh, on the website like the different countries we have so if you just click there you can see whether you have something in your country already going on and if you don't please contact me um, so we'll we can get something started wonderful okay Thea so much more we could talk about including your American uh, football career <laughs> um, super intrigued by that introduction but we'll leave it there for today um, great seeing you again and take good care you too. Thank you.